And uh, she's just an all around good person. She's just an all around good person, but she's also a doctor, but she's a specific kind of doctor. Like if you've got an elbow pain, she's going to go, does it hurt when you do that? She's going to go, don't do that. That's what she's going to do. But if it comes to being a professional sales, reading body language, communicating, by gosh, she's got her stuff in order. She's an author and a speaker. Here she is, Dr. Donna Van Atten. How are you? Hi. How's that elbow treating you? <laughs> it's good. Did I get that right? If somebody's got a bad elbow, you're not helping them. Nope. I'm not. I always say, like, I'm a doctor, but I'm not that kind. So if you have a problem, I'll be happy to write you a note. Yeah. And, but if they've got a kind of a handshake issue, you can help them with that. Absolutely. Oh, you know what? All of it from head to toe. I'm your person of how you communicate with your body. Well, you know, what? and these are very casual conversations and we're going to pull up comments because I know a buddy of mine, Gary Miller, has got, I think uh, he knows somebody that's a good friend of yours. Uh, yeah. So he, he might chime in here in a second. Um, but just like all good communication, this all starts up here, right? It starts in your brain. Right. Typically in your limbic system, right there in the amygdala. Not the critical thinking part, but way inside here is that little amygdala, that little lima bean with full of emotions that we try to control with our critical brain, but all too often gives us away if things you, don't go well. You have written three books, The Image Scrimmage, uh, body, the, uh, body, body Language of Politics, and The mm -hmm. Body Language for Women. Is that correct? Is The Body Language for Women is the most recent, right? It is. Actually, you know, COVID... With um, the publishing house, you know, freezing everything, like the whole world stopped, uh, so did the publication of the two books, or I should say the release of them. But they did release them, and uh, Body Language for Women came out this year, and so exciting. And uh, it's been, you know, I didn't get to have the big hoopla of uh, you know, going out and Barnes & Noble doing a great job, but... Um, it came out, and I've really enjoyed sharing it with others, and um, seems like it's moving along like it's supposed to. Do you, and, and I asked you beforehand, and I'm actually looking up, so I'm not, I'm not really ignoring you. I'm actually looking up the name of Gary's friend so I can bring it up because okay. that, that way I'm not going to be disrespectful and just make up a name. Um, <laughs> but do you, do, you, do you like the writing process? Do you enjoy that? Well, you know, it's interesting. I actually called it kind of the rooster phase because you're laying there and, um, you, you know, just kind of like churns in your head. You know that feeling when you have something going on. And so writing it down is so helpful or just get up and deal with it kind of thing. And I was actually doing some planning for next year. And if, if you, sh I'll kind of show you what my brain was doing yesterday as far as how I write. So it kind of looks like this. I know. Oh, yeah. That is my, that is my brain on a subject. So it just kind of has little tendrils and an octopus look to it, and you just get it out there. And that's kind of how the chapters came to be um, with the help of the publisher of what they specifically wanted in the books, you know, because when you have a publisher, we can pretend that it's all mine. <laughs> we can pretend I picked these people out right. or this color or this font, uh, but that's not, that's not the case. They say things like, do you like it? Which really means this is what we're going with. We hope you like it. Absolutely. It'll fake like you like it. You know, one thing too, do you, uh, and I asked, uh, Gary Miller just wrote a book, um, um, Finding Grace. Um, and I asked him how he handled critical feedback. And before we move on, I want to say Mike Carter, because I like- I know who our mutual friend is for that, by the way. I, I know exactly who you're talking about. Kathy? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep, Kathy. There we go. Yep. There we go. Uh, I Mike know Mike. Carter, Mike Carter said, Donna Hi, and Mike. I talked- taught school at Lafette Middle. She is a good friend, an outstanding teacher, definitely an outside the box teacher. Thank you. <laughs> Mike's, yeah, by the way, Mike's, uh, Mike was one of the best boxers in Chattanooga, by the way. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Mike and I go a long way back. I had just moved from California and Las Vegas and got a job down there and I was in seventh and he was in sixth. And I guess coming from California, I was, I was definitely an out of the box kind of teacher. I believed uh, in a lot of you know, physical and play and materials and arts and, you know, ask for anything I wanted. I'm, I think I probably threw the school into a spin kind of thing, but Mike, Mike's been great all these years. Uh, <laughs> so the thing I brought to Gary was critical feedback. So he, you've written several books. He's not, he wrote, this was mm -hmm. his first one. Uh, when you send it in and you get an editor and, and other eyes on it, is it hard when you've invested and poured so much of yourself into something? Is it hard when you get those red pages back? Like, what do you mean you don't like that? And usually it's not a matter of them not liking it. It's they'll see in their opinion that it's redundancy 
or oh you you kind of covered that earlier um so cut that out or look we want to cut out about three thousand words and you're like but they're my beautiful words <laughs> and you cut um they can do it to you on a particular writing style or the way something is is phrased and that's i think that's probably the hardest part is your writing style with somebody who may have a different writing style or for example use of commas you know i'm old school commas and i might have an editor who says too many commas and i'm like but they belong there <laughs> i uh i am guilty of not being well versed in punctuation like i should so when i write i will throw commas and semicolons around like salt oh. i just sprinkle them in. yeah yeah that's probably not a good idea i, I actually follow the, the rules you know <laughs> just do you remember the days like when it was something something and something and you're like is there a comma after the second one before the and well yes there is, there is. but now should we leave it off or should we leave it on kind of thing so i would always put it on they're like no let's get rid of it or or spelling out letter or numbers um, or just writing the number itself. So there's rules for those. So they have these writing rules for everything. And and it really is the style, you know, because of course I asked, because I ask about everything. And it's really the writing or literary style of the publisher and their ultimate rights. So I may own the words, but they own the book. <laughs> um, I, I think I shared this story when you were on with me last, or I may not have, but back in college, my first semester, I was a journalism major. I was going to be a oh, journalist because I love okay. to write. I write poetry and I do that. I've written some short stories and some songs and all that. I love to write. Uh -huh. And so after my first semester, my journalism professor came to me and he goes, hey, you're one of the most creative writers that I've ever, you are really good. Okay. He goes, you need to get out of anything that requires discipline with the written word because you will never make it as a journalist. This is before. Free style. Yeah. It's before we had autocorrect and he goes, That's right. you're going to drive me insane and you're going to be miserable. And it was the best advice I got. I went and got into something, wow. and something else. But. but, you know, if you think about it, um, you know, music artists, I mean, look at Taylor Swift, it's poetry, you know, and, and where you choose to inflect or how the, uh, the twist of two words, you know, to however you want to put it. So honestly, your, your words might be perfect for music or somebody that's a true artist. Yeah, but it would drive somebody like you that does follow the rules insane. You would be like, hey, don't send me anything else ever. Uh, it's not ain't, it isn't or is not, right? It's not <laughs> me and somebody. It's somebody and I, but depending on the me. Yeah. And I'm the guy that goes, oh, you know what I meant. Yeah, that's it. Right. Well, that's because that's because we're getting older, Clint. We get to say that. You know what I meant. Yeah. <laughs> hey, so how did you get into being the, the body language doctor? How did you go from teaching and from California and, and Las Vegas? So now you 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 speak, and we're going to talk about some of the things you've done and you're getting ready to do. But how did you get? How did you make that transformation? You know, I uh, one of my degrees is in sociology, so I've always been fascinated with, by people and groups. And you know, when I was teaching, um, I just loved the whole group dynamics, particularly of teenagers. You know, I taught what the, what was called junior high or was now middle school, and I just thought they were hilarious and fascinating. And and I saw a lot of similarities with adults basically saying that we act like 14 year olds or the masses do. And so, you know, carrying on and then, you know, doing public education formally, I probably wasn't the greatest fit. I challenged the systems too much, you know, worked my way down and out of the department of education. And my mom gave me some great advice. She said, um, cause I said, you know, should I go back in the classroom? You know, cause it's kind of safe and I kept my license and she, and she said, you know, you can always go back Donna. So, but she said, you know what? And she kind of, you know, put her hand across and she said, why not let this, meaning the world be your classroom so i took a very educational approach to it and i continued my formal education and began speaking you know which i had a natural affinity to be able to do and and you know if you speak well you typically can write well because it's just the written or the spoken word and how you deliver it and you know i, I did a lot i did, did and do a lot of grant writing what i call my meat and potatoes work because again it's just storytelling you know telling a story to to of course win money to to implement a program and then i you know people asked me to speak on stuff and um i knew that i i quickly picked up that you know like how we communicate and really dove into the dynamics of speaking and tone of voice and then there was bodies you know bodies involved and and again fascinated with humans and groups began to dive into that and you know and it just 
kind of rolled along. And then I had a couple of great role models and mentors who just helped me along the way, like most of us have, or are fortunate to have. And here's what I ended up doing. And I actually connected with, you know, and I picked up some ink articles and, and my, my friend there was great. And the book, actually, the first book came about because I was speaking somewhere and they said, hey, you know, we're going to set up a table for you to sign your book. And I'm like, book. Uh, great. And I said, oh, my book's not um, here, you know, and I, and she's like, well, when does it come out? And I'm like, November. <laughs> <laughs> yes. November. November's great. And uh, she's like, great. And I, I got in the car and I'm like, no. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, but all the stuff for the book is stuff that I had been sharing with other people anyway. So it was yeah. really just putting it down and then looking at what was out there. And most of the work in body language is done by males coming out of a private sector or government and so why not take a more social corporate you know not military approach to it about people dynamics you know what, what my field in it and then it was picked up by skyhorse publishing for book two and and book three and here's where i uh, here's where i am so well, I, i've been a career since 2008 well, and you said something kind of interesting that most of the books at that time when you were getting into it had been written by men. And I'm sure that I'm, you know, being a guy, I'm sure I would relate to a lot of the advice, but there's so there, there are some things that are true across the board for men and women. Like me and you, there's certain things that are just, they are what they are, but there are nuances in difference based off who we are individually. Oh, sure. That is, I think is important. So you feel a you feel a void, a niche there that's, that's great. Well, yeah. Well, thanks. And, you know, it was fortunate. I had some nice affirmations. So a man named Joe Navarro is the number one body language expert in the world, actually, a retired FBI. And we connected. I actually um, put something from a Warren, Warren Buffett article on his post. And he reached out to me and said, I want to talk to you, Donna. And I'm like, uh-oh. And, you know, we had the nicest Zoom. And he said, look, I, I looked you up. I've been following you. And I want you to say that you remind me of me. 10 to 15 years ago and anything I can do to help you. And wow, what a wow. push. And so I came back relatively soon and said, would you mind writing the forward for one of my books <laughs> since you offered? And, you know, that kind of affirmation really helps. And, you know, word of mouth, it's it, in the sense of you get one job and it leads to another, which leads to another and, and you know, institutes that are statewide or national and and whether the client is a healthcare or in banking or in education it, it really doesn't matter it sales you know real estate agents you know you know sales very well um, and and you have great mastery of how to present so there's behaviors and you know constantly reaffirmed in the data of how humans behave and, you know, and how we violate that or how we mirror and build rapport. So it doesn't really matter the industry as long as people are involved in it, then I'm, then I can be involved in it. I, if, if somebody says like, Hey, we have a strategic planning meeting and I'm like, I have to get my hair done. <laughs> I know my limitations. So it wouldn't be sitting in those kind of things. I think I'll stay home for that one. But when it comes to people, I actually find people fascinating on many different levels. When you have people approach you with questions, are there some common questions? Is there, if Absolutely. 10 people come up to you, are seven of them asking pretty much the one, same one or two questions? Yes. And that's because most people, 99 plus, have some type of knowledge of what body language is. Oh, I know what that is. Oh, and they always cross their arms. Does this mean I'm being defensive? You know, what if I don't look at you? So those are the quick classic ones kind of things. And so, you know, of course, I'm like, yeah, it's a little bit deeper than that. But sure, you pick up on things. You know, like it, I notice that you have this pen. So you're obviously or an artifact that you're writing something down and that your head is tilted, you know, uh, and so you're not coming. I'm taking notes on my friend Donna. That's how I take my notes. <laughs> So, yeah. Exactly. I know you're like, oh my gosh, it's her. And what's funny is when I speak with people in the beginning, I usually don't tell them what I do. So they get pretty comfortable. Then it kind of comes around to me about what do you do? And I'm like, I tell them and they're like, oh my God, I'm like, it's too late. Just, <laughs> You've already made your first impression. They just sit like this. Like, yeah. Hey, yeah neutral. Right. Neutral stance, neutral hand position. And those are hard to stand in a neutral with the, with the legs coming off the pelvis straight down and put your hands at your side with a relaxed hand. Those are hard neutral positions to be in. We want to do something with our body. 
Mm -hmm. Did, was it easy for you to adapt? Okay, let me back up. Let me ask it a different way. As you started learning more about how the unspoken word was communicating, mm -hmm. was it difficult for you to train your body to kind of adapt certain positions that you knew conveyed what you wanted to convey at the time? Or did that come naturally? I think what you're talking about is being intentional. Yeah. And so once thank you, you for, understand thank that, you for summing that up and what I'm here for you. I I, I gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> yes, by being intentional, we're, we're never going to have a hundred percent perfect communication, whether it's speaking to somebody on the phone, texting, it's because we can't control what another person does. However, can we manipulate? Sure, we manipulate all day long. We're, that's how we navigate our, our world. So in saying that, are there things that we can do? to build rapport or to put across a kind of a certain thing or a particular pitch of our tone absolutely and so i'm very aware of these you know and they are fairly tried and true you know uh in the sense of if we want to whatever spin we want to put on when we're communicating with somebody of how we want it to go so i'm going to pick your brain on something then i'm going to jump in because we're going to cover mask uh some zooms i want to make sure everybody knows what you're doing now what you're as far as your coaching so there's some things we're going to cover but i got back into it after i shut my company down two years ago uh two or three years ago about nine i oh know i guess about a year ago now i i started up my coaching again so i'm helping okay. sell people but i've got a couple of females that I, i'm helping on the sales side of stuff processes and things mm -hmm. And one of the things that that I was going to ask you about tonight that I'm going to share with them, I'm not taking credit for it, but is how to convey confidence uh, quickly in a sales meeting when you're meeting somebody that you've either been talking to just on the phone or just via Zoom. And now I'm in a in a sales, we're meeting that first introduction and you're a young female and confidence. Sure. You may know what you're doing, but that confidence. Are there certain mm -hmm. things you can teach them or you would tell them to, to focus on and work on? Absolutely. I mean, gender dynamics are real. Whether we want to say, I don't notice color, I don't notice age, I don't notice gender. Actually, we notice all of it. You yeah. know, so let's let's be real. And so in saying that, you know, you might have one age population notice that a younger female what would she be talking about? Who would she think she is? She reminds me of my daughter kind of thing. So the female, and so if she's physically smaller, she needs to be made physically bigger. So is she, what's, what's her carriage? You know, what's her, what's her gait? You know, is she, is, is she extending that? Um, even though old school is that you wait for your handshake from a male? No, uh, a female initiates a handshake. And make sure when that you're doing that, that you're standing up. You know, if you're already seated and somebody comes in, you know, a lot of times they'll, oh, it's nice to meet you. And you kind of look up. No, stand up. Make that first impression. It's a lasting impression. And eye contact. You know, we are an eye contact culture. So when we're not really looking at somebody, we're like, hmm, why, why are you averting your gaze and so forth? So there's definitely some things that you should do, whether male or female, to make a great first impression because we do remember those things. I mean, if you think about it, Clint, years ago, you know, you'd hear people say, yeah, I got the tractor loan. Gonna put her there. Put her there, man. And, you know, women are you know the, kind of known for this fishy, mushy kind of handshake, or I'm not sure what to do. And and so the handshake was so, it was the contract. And, and by the strength of it, and, and you know, men, you'll see them still kind of jostle, you know, a little positioning of who's the power position, oh, and am I going to give I it to you? I learned this from you. Not only will we shake hands, but if it's, if it's even, then I'm mm -hmm. going to reach up and touch the elbow or the shoulder. Right, right. Yeah, right. like it's time for me to take this hand and do something oh, with it. <laughs> stroke his head a little bit or something. I'm just kidding. Yeah, yeah. And you'll see that in um, politics all the time, you know, with world leaders of, of positioning and how the handshake goes and who do you give it to, you know, and, and the hands are, are a great example of an extension of what we're thinking, you know, and it's the first time, if you think about it, that we put our physically touch somebody else to, to get a feel for them uh, because normally we don't want to be touched, of course. Yeah. So here we go. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you a quick story uh, about my daughter that will make you proud. She is 17, almost 18. So we were taking college tours and we went mm -hmm. up to Tennessee Tech. <clears throat> okay. So they're giving us this. It's a beautiful campus. It's changed so much since I had friends go up there in the, in the 80s. I mean, in the 90s. And um, so anyway, this girl that's given me and this little group uh, uh, showing us around, she goes, now this is exercise science. And this is where you would be taking this class with this 
professor, we don't know he's a professor, they're playing basketball because it's on the weekend, right? Mm -hmm. So he's walking out and he got turned around. And he goes, so is this group, and there's about 20 of us. He goes, is this group, um, are y'all thinking about coming to Tennessee Tech? Is this a tour? And they go, yeah. And he goes, and you're going to be exercise science? And the lady goes, well, this guy and then this young lady right here. And they go, he goes, well, I'm, I'm getting in the middle of something, but I will be your head. I will probably be your advisor and one of your lead professors. And out of this group, Katie, shout out to Katie, took three steps forward and stuck her hand out. She goes, my name's Katie. You're going to want to remember oh, that. Perfect. And the guy stopped what he was doing because he had turned to walk off, mm -hmm. turned around, around, grabbed her hand, shook her hand, and looked at me and looked at her. And he goes, I'll remember that and turn around. Like, Good off. job, dad. Yeah. Good job. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's we, so true though. It's so true. I mean, you know, to take that initiative and to stand out, there's nothing wrong with it. And, and if anybody felt threatened by that, they shouldn't, you know, oh. because it didn't come at a cost to them. It came at a benefit to Katie. Yeah. yeah. Good job, just, dad. We were walking off and everybody was in front of us and she looked over at me. I looked at her. She goes, I know. I went, yeah, super proud. But we, we'll talk about that in the car later on. Um, you get to get ice cream when we get absolutely. in the car. Absolutely. You know, our world the last two years has been Zooms now, this kind of conversation. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I'm sure it was a learning, even though you're a communication expert, it's still a learning curve for you. You're always learning too. Sure. So I'm going to talk about the Zoom etiquette here and you can give us some tips. But I think you yeah. said something before we came live I thought was pretty fascinating. You were on a video, I guess it was a Zoom call with mm -hmm. uh, the daily is it daily mail the daily mail. oh daily mail uk right yeah. they love to cover the royals yeah well and so you you said though they said they want to go on early and talk about your mm -hmm. positioning yes oh so yeah exactly so it comes to where our eyes are on the screen you know we don't want to be too high we don't want to be too low looking up looking down and so they do pre-calls you know, like most new shows do, to ensure that your eyes are looking right at the camera. So when I'm looking at you, it looks like I'm actually looking at you and nothing else versus, you know, I'm paying attention to the chat down in the corner kind of thing yeah. because we're very sensitive about where our eyes go, which you're absolutely right, Clint. The whole pandemic has messed up everything because we're a social creature. We want to be with other people. And so this pandemic has really has us at our human core and you know, when you take away the body, you know, that 100%, that 55% or half of how we communicate goes somewhere else between our words and our tone. And we wonder why we're hypersensitive, you know, like I, I just said the little stuff thing and she bit my head off and you're like, so we became hypersensitive. And then what we have, what we now is called, you know, fatigue with Zoom because we have an extra cognitive load on our brains. So never have we had to enter, you know, engage with you. And I also see myself, you know, you'll see people and they're like, hi, it's good to see. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> you know, we don't do that in person unless we see a mirror and we, you know, turn away. So you'll see people actually cover up themselves because we're not used to seeing ourselves and, or everybody else on the screen. And what are the time delays of I talk, you talk, and oh, sorry about that. And then you throw in trying to run the PowerPoint or share this piece of information or ask questions or have a group dialogue. It's really heavy on the load. Um, so Zoom fatigue or video fatigue is real. And so there are definitely things to do. Like it can't be the same time. It, it, it has to be different so that we can handle it as a human because our brains are designed, our, our you know, these beautiful brains are designed to let things go it's it's a processor and so we want to let things go let it go let it go and so this is one of the things you know now we're at the point two years into this people are like do i have to turn my camera on yeah, <laughs> yeah. right the, the fun the fun is gone of like hi Clint, oh my gosh how are you now it's like clint is this live or is this person or is we just going to talk on the phone or do i have to be at that meeting can i listen to a recording so sure, and of course things are changing now, coming back hybrid or in person, and people become more comfortable with this platform, which is yeah. important. You know, but we adapt very quickly. We really want to because we want other people. People are like, look, I don't want to talk to anybody. But as an animal, as a human, yes, we are a pack animal. So we want others. We need others. Did it help you a little bit in your business? I mean, I would this is just an assumption and you can you can correct it if I'm wrong. I'm assuming though there are things that happened over the last two years mm -hmm. that that met head on with your skill set that allowed you to help people navigate it as you were learning, but actually will people will take things from this pandemic and use them moving forward that they can get better at. In other words, 
I have personally found that people that two, three years ago would have said, I'm never going to get to know Zoom or technology. <laughs> I've got people now that are like, hey, dude. Listen, are we on Teams? Are we on Meets today? Yeah. Are we Zooming? What are we doing today? Are we, what I, app are we using? Can I be on my phone? I talked to a buddy of mine the other day, and he's like, hey, just, we'll just jump on a Zoom. I'm like, who are you? Yeah, I send, in, I send invites out. I'm like, do you want to call or you want to Zoom? Like, how personal do we want to make this? It, right, right, it's an option now, and we have become much more comfortable. And that's just like anything. You know, remember when we first had phones, and they were big and clumpy and clumsy, and now and now we have this black screen, and you're like, make it work. You know, I hold this up. I'm like, you know what to do with this, right, kind did, of thing. So, did sure. Did you better serve your clients, and your, did, did, did this help you reach more people? I think it was different because people didn't – people – some know, some don't know how to behave on a, on this platform, you know, and so there's rules still, just like being in person. We have etiquette rules that people violate all the time from food and background lighting to where to have your eyes. But what I've always picked up on is facial expressions, you know, and, and what's a sincere smile of the crinkling and the pulling of the zygomatics and so forth. And what are we wearing? But what's the background, you know, because this is the first time we're in people's houses. We're like, hi, it's nice to see. You. Oh, is that your kitchen? Oh, I have those glasses. You know, oh gosh, you're a mess. You know, you're a slob. Oh, definitely. We are now in people's homes or their bedrooms. And that's very different. There's a lot of new judgments coming on about people. And, and because you know, and some people seem, I don't care, but I'm like, um, ah. but what it reminds me of is remember the whole the dating thing and you take your profile picture to put on there and males are notorious for taking the picture in the bathroom, in the mirror and behind them is the shower with the curtain open. And my, my, my big thought is, isn't there one person in your life, just one that says, come on, let's go stand outside by that tree. Yes. You don't have to take it in the bathroom where they see your shampoo and razor, you know? Yeah. Um, and right. But that tells you a lot. It does. And it's okay to put a shirt on. Everybody, yeah. you know, just every, just on a profile pic, dudes, if you're on some dating app out there, shirts are okay. Girls like shirts too. Put a shirt we on. Do. Oh, we do. We do. We do like shirts because, you know, skin is a, is a fascinating subject. And, you know, it is a living organ. And, it, and depending where the skin is on your body, it could be sexual. There are zones that we can touch. And, you know, what's not to touch and what we see. And, you know, women... You usually show more skin at work. That's, you know, from short sleeves to a skirt to the ankle. Men, the traditional male work attire of a pants, socks, a closed shoe, a button down shirt up to here. You only see what the male wants you to see. And that's the hands and the face. So there's a lot of focus on him as, wow, he's controlling his, his mechanism, mm -hmm. if you will. And yeah. uh, so the same thing on Zoom and what do you get to see or the same thing in pictures yeah, we, we, it happens naturally. And, and we, we can say that we don't want to be judgy. Of course not. You know, no one wants to be the judge, but we constantly judge our environment because we need to be alive in it. So if I see a dark figure and a shadow coming my way, I'm not going to think, I wonder if maybe it's a, just a, a tall lady selling flowers. No. <laughs> We have a, a pre-construct of what that's going to be, you know, just like when we hear a certain pitch or tone, we're like, oh, it's a kid. So it's it's just how we navigate our, our world. And um, we will always default to something more negative than, you know, default to a positive for, to stay alive and to stay well. Yeah, I don't know who, and I'm sure that uh, I've looked it up before. I don't remember the history of the necktie and suits. So I am mm -hmm. built like a minion. I am sh I'm five ten on and a half on a very good day with the right shoes on, and I have this weird kind of neck. So mm -hmm. when you put me, but I have like long leg. It's really weird. So my daughter, I wore this yellow shirt all the time when I was in sales. And I had this tie, and I never could button the neck because I had right. I had a, a bigger neck, an 18 inch neck, but my, my shirt to get an 18 inch neck, the sleeves would hang over my so hand. You have a, squ uh, a, a SpongeBob square pants. Is that what you're well, letting my me My daughter know? called me SpongeBob because I was wearing this yellow shirt. She goes, dad, you look like SpongeBob. I'm like, mm, well, and you're not going to drop <laughs> to your 19. So. And here's what you say. Who lives in a pineapple under the sea? You know, so, that's what I'd say. Square pants. Um, but, you know, there's an interesting thing about neckties. So uh, men, you know, it's part of the uniform. Typically, when you wear your shirt, you know, you have a size shirt and you put your tie on and you go to work and so forth. And and then you'll notice, like, you know, it kind of gets uncomfortable and then they're clawing at it. You're trying to get that button undone. And it's because as as the day wears on and our blood pressure, you know, 
fluctuates and when our it heats our body up and things that heat expand physically expand it becomes uncomfortable but we have we have these idioms for all these body parts that do things and one of them is this bottleneck and so if you think about it you know you have all your brain you know stuff going on and you, then it all comes to this little skinny area and then it gets big again so literally we hit a bottleneck you know in our like oh gosh and we rub it and we try to undo this because it's not going to go down quickly so um if you feel that it's a really it's a physiological thing that your body is doing to you i've got a better idea and if i when i was a manager of some radio stations it, we're past the necktie unless it's a presentation mm -hmm. or you're going someplace where you know that is appropriate for the sales environment that you're going to be in don't don't force people to wear your don't wear neckties it's, it's right. stupid it's dumb and I fought it every day of my life since 1995. <laughs> it's a horrible thing. And it's probably uh, like uh, nylons for women. You know what I mean? Yes. I listen. I'm all for the, the the. I'm not talking about comfortable like I'm wearing my t-shirt and jeans. But if you can look professional but mm -hmm. be comfortable, you will sell. You will perform better because right. your mind is more free to function. Yeah. That's my. I um. I and to know who your client is and to know what environment you're walking into, mm -hmm. you know, really, I mean, if you, if you're on a, a job site, you know, outside and you're, you know, whip out of the car and you have a lovely pair of high heeled boots on, you're too busy. You don't have time for where you're trying to get, you know, you have to adapt and, and you have to understand your environment, which is exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Did you have a lot of people reach out to you, um, about the the wearing of the mask because uh, the nonverbal yeah. stuff like I'll, I'll go to stores now and here's what i've noticed when i go into the store you know how you'll have those just incidental moments where somebody will, will they're pushing their buggy and you both come to the same and you were like oh excuse me well it used mm -hmm. to be you would smile and go oh excuse me right right, right. now all they see is this mm -hmm. and so now staring got, at you yeah people go Oh, excuse me. They like wave. It's like I'm right. doing charades. Right. Or, or I, I think one of the things we do now is when we lock eyes, we uh, do the little, <laughs> like, I see you. You know, I see part of you, but, yeah. and you auto, and you automatically get that back. Yeah. And it means I see you and you see me without the, kind of, but you know, the, the smile, you know, Clint is, it happens here, but honestly it happens up in here, you know, at the, at the zygomatic, at your crow's feet, if you will. So when somebody is smiling, you know, you're looking for all this to be, and even the line underneath the eye here, mm -hmm. that's an authentic, you know, we, we hate it. And, and that's why when people have Botox and so forth, we're like, I can't put a good read on your face. Well, that makes sense, you know, because it's frozen where it shouldn't be. And, and, you know, we see surprise and the eyebrows go up, you know, and, and we see when, you know, the eyebrows drop when you're kind of squinting or, or you're trying to question. And, you know, if you're trying to hear somebody, it's natural that we, we become offset to bring the ear forward, you know, in the sense of what, mm -hmm. and, you know, and sometimes we're like, yeah, we know. so we have wonderful nonverbals that we really aren't dependent on our voice when we have so many other, you know, the tone, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, oh, and, and like, for example, one of the tones, pitch. Pitch is the part of our tone of voice that enables us to recognize somebody in a crowd. So when you hear Katie, you know, in a crowded area, it's Katie's pitch, her natural pitch. You're like, oh, that's my kid kind of thing. So we know that's how we identify. It's not just like what they say. And then she might be going, dad. But if she had gone like, like, you know, where, where's the, uh, where's the plunger? And you're like, oh, that's my kid. Yeah. <laughs> kind of right? So, yeah. So we have all these other things to help us out, but absolutely masks have made it so much more difficult, but you know, immediately we adapted, right? Mm -hmm. People went to cloth to color. They went to try to get the fit because it's not natural. You know, they fidget with it and so forth. You'll see people, you know, wear it here or adjust and they're, they're constantly, because for the most part, we don't touch our faces. We typically only touch our faces if we have a change in behavior. So we're irritated that this mask thing is going on or, you know, the Pinocchio effect of, of not telling the truth is little catecholamines, you know, little irritants. And you have this thing going on. You're like, Hmm, what else is going on here? Kind of thing. I didn't know and that. Like well, real quick, slow down there, Miss. I got all this information in my brain. There's the <laughs> there's the real Pinocchio effect. Oh sure, yeah. That we have these little 
so typically, you know, you'll see people put their hands. I mean, for example, Bill Clinton during his um, lying phase of his yeah. relationship, whenever you saw him on TV, he, his something was always here. You know, it was basically hooked around, you know. Wow. <laughs> Definitely. Or you'll see a lot, you know, um, the uh, politician wiener. You know, remember the yeah, whole Anthony things he was doing? Yeah, he's got tons of, you know, this kind of look going on photos. And it's, it's, there's little chemical irritants that, you know, your body gives you away. That is, well, by golly, now I, when I'm asking some questions, I'm going to be going. I know. Well, look, I, and that brings me to a good point. So you never want to look at anything in, in a single, you know, you want to look for clusters, at least clusters of three. So if, if something triggers a change in you and it's fast, usually, you know, it could be a micro expression. It could be a, a shift of the body. Don't, you know, d one of these does not warrant liar. <laughs> <You're>, <laughs> right. Prevent a, a bunch of fights. Now. You touched your nose. You lied to me, right? Where were you? Um, oh, you lied, right? So, and so you want to look for what else the body is doing because the body is really what leaks when things aren't, you know, we're, we can master the word, we can master the eye contact, you know, and if you're looking or staring or looking away, it's not the, the telltale of telling the truth or lying, but the body, you know, it's hard to control all of that on your brain or that cognitive load. So the body tends to, you know, the, you know, the body, you know, Tells the truth. <laughs> hey, and if it comment. comes to you, oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I was just gonna. If I was gonna say, if if it's the the words or the body, and they don't align, we will believe the body. Is that a subconscious thing too? Right. I mean, we just lock that back in our brain. Like, yeah, they're not. They're full of crap. They're not telling me the truth. Right. Like when yeah. somebody is smiling, you're like, you so hate me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You are not happy. I'm here at all. Are you? Yeah. You know what's really, uh, and then I'll read, let me read this real quick thing for Gary. He posted a minute ago, but he said, although I've never met her, uh, your guest has an excellent professional reputation as inspiring and fun corporate trainer, speaker, and author. Thank you, Gary. And we're going to get into that in just a Thanks, second Gary. before we wrap it up. <laughs> um, but, and I, I know I've shared this on, on a number of podcasts. When you talked about tone a little bit, I was recording commercials in the mid nineties when I was uh, at talk radio and KZ 106. And I was a sales guy, but they every now and then needed extra voices on commercials uh -huh. and they needed somebody. That, so they would call, hey, Clint, come here. I need you to voice this, you know. Sure, oh, sure. Like Chevy. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, I was in there with somebody and I can't remember who it was. I think it actually might have been with Dale Deason at some point in time. But anyway, they had me read this line two or three times and it was three or four sentences. And then he said, hey, do me a favor smile even when you don't feel it just smile while you're reading right I'm like he goes fake a smile i don't care just smile so i smiled and i said oh, i like the blue chevy you know and so right he right. let me listen to the four or five i recorded mm -hmm. and he said see if you can pick out the one you smiled he mixed them up and i picked it out and he goes yeah. man there's just something about it you can tell most yes. of the time. So I give advice to clients now, if they're on the phone with a hard conversation, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. breathing and smiling actually will come through in the, on the other side. Right. Right. And along with uh, planted feet, planted mind. So if you have a topic that you really want to cover, don't wrap your feet around your chair, cross them over planted feet, planted mind. So it goes through your entire body. Are you a stand-up person when you have a conversation? If, if it's a phone and you need to, is I'm a stand-up guy. I, e either is okay oh, for me, okay. depending how I want it to go. Honestly, just depending who's on the other side there, and um, you know. But but I think some of it here is to understand who you are. You know, no one is saying that you have to be a certain way. You know, people want their their freedom to express, but there are rules. You violate the rules. They're not written down. Some are written down. You know, but there's a huge list of, of rules and um, you're, you're best to learn them if you will. And that's fortunately, that's what I get to do is I get to help people be intentional. Um, you know, you could be moving up the ladder, you know, the corporate ladder or going from manager to director, or you want to advance your career or something with a relationship or, you know, from friends. Like I, the, the book is, you know, there's chapters on girlfriend relationships, romantic relationships, childhood relationships that got us here. And even though it says like body language for women, Let's face it, it's yeah. body language for people, but we right. just know that there's differences and, and the studies um, affirm this, actually. You know, I, I don't do the research. I'm not, I choose not to be a principal investigator, but I read the current research and then I 
share it with the public. You know, who wants to sit and read uh, peer-reviewed journals? Buddy. <laughs> but if I tell you, like, look, 500 people, and here's what they did to them, and this is what they did 80% of the time, wow, you know, that's good to know. Do you like speaking? I mean, if you, if somebody told you you can make a living speaking or writing books, would it be speaking? Oh. Okay, yeah. <laughs> there is no, there is no um, author in me that says one day I'll write a book. The book came out of need or necessity. You know, it went along with the speaking. And so, if I could speak full time, uh, travel, continue to travel. You know, I have, um, I, you know, fortunately, I'm, I'll be in full Florida, and then I was asked to speak in Thailand, right, at a women's conference in the spring. How real quick, um, how'd they find you? How do you? How did you get found for Thailand? Well, you know, sometimes if you target women's topics and so forth, it comes up and they do call for speakers or present a paper uh, or something, you know, whatever yeah. your niche market is. And and body language is kind of a niche uh, topic. You know, some people speak on things that are pretty common. and But body language, again, applies to all industries and, or communication in general because it, everybody needs it. You know, whether you're in your 20s, your teens, a kid, you're in your 50s. Um, there's always a need to improve that for all for all of us. And so my intention truly, and I've known this early on, Clinton, I've even said this before, is to teach somebody something. You know, I don't know what it is. I don't know who, you know, my number will be up because I check that box. But my intent is always to help. So, you know, I would say 99% of the time it goes off really well, but there's 1% that never quite appreciate my feedback. <laughs> uh, you're a teacher at heart. I mean, you brought that in with you. You know, that's your original teacher. <clears throat> have you? And I and think I that have. really helped a lot. <clears throat> uh, excuse me. I'm sorry. I was <clears throat> got something in my throat. I uh, you have something in your throat. Are you are you being <clears throat> honest with me? Is you have a little tickle there? Something in my throat. I'm just saying. <laughs> it's. I'm really. No, I've been on. Uh, I've spoken in front of people and a number of times, and <laughs> it's really weird because I will deliver. I've got five or six different talks that I do that may vary a little bit, but they're just mm -hmm. based off, you know, you know how it is. You've, you've got yours in a can and you can change it as needed, but sure. the meat is the same. But there's been times I've done stuff that I've said something and one crowd will be like, they'll, I'll get the giggles that I need, yeah. you know, and I, okay, I'm on track. They're following. Yeah. Then there's other times when I go, and then I said, no, you're not a coconut, you know, and they'll go, you're right. what the hell's a coconut? And you're like, oh, uh, yeah, I need to recover pretty quickly here. Yeah, and just, those moments are horrible, man. Those are just terrible moments. Right when you, well, uh, it's your guaranteed applause getter, right? And then yeah. you're like, no, nobody's, nobody's clapping. <laughs> you know, I did something in Nashville. This was probably four years ago, and it wasn't a big group. It was like thirty or forty little bit uh, small business owners, and I mm -hmm. tried it. And now I do it. If I, of course, I haven't done it in a couple of years because of COVID. Um, but I've got this little thing that I talk about is as a sales rep, especially it's good in all relationships. I think it's the power of silence. Mm -hmm. And so I told we I would be up in front of them and I said, listen, silence is very heavy and you can use it as a tool if you know when right. and how to use it. And I said, for instance, and this is my mistake. The first time I made it, I, I made this mistake. Now, when I'm on stage or I'm in front of people, I will go 10 seconds. That's eternity when you're in it front is. of I went 30 seconds the first time I tried wow. it. And by the end of it, yeah. I was so uncomfortable. I was like, yeah, like <laughs> sweats beating up here is running down your back. You're like, how do I get out of this? I was right? 15 seconds into it going, this is the, what am I? And I had my timer because I said, I'm going to sit 30 seconds. Anyway, I just, uh, I miss doing that stuff though. I miss, yeah. do you That's ever my miss favorite. when you don't get to do it? Do you miss it? Oh, I miss it all the time. I really do. I and I'm I I like you is the bigger the audience, the more enjoyable it is, right? The bigger the platform, you know, the, the and I think I really see it as an honor that um somebody wants to come and listen to what I have to say. Wow. That's really humbling, you know, mm -hmm. um, because I'd love to share the knowledge that I have. And that's probably why you and I to get along so well as we can go back and forth and we kind of understand this. And it's just enjoyable because and I, and I've even heard that before. It was like your approach, on is a little bit different. I said, well, you know, I was with uh, 14 year olds for a long time and I understand pedagogy and adult learning theory and things like that and, and how humans want to learn, you know, basically. And, and it should be fun and it should be interactive. And let's face it, body language is extremely interactive. 
Well, and you, you've kind of, I didn't know you did this. I know, I, I guess I think I did know, but I didn't know it was as big a part of your, uh, your resume is the coaching side of it, the corporate coaching and mm -hmm. uh, the, the people, the process that, and has that been something you've done for years and years and years? And it I is. just, no, I'm, I apologize. It is. I, um, I don't know how long ago I became Gallup certified as a, as a strength-based coach, you know, because let's face it. It, you know, we all know our weaknesses. If not, just have your exes line up. They'll point them out for you for free. <laughs> but do we capitalize on our innateness, our strengths that we have? And, and they may not, they might just be a raw talent. You know, you and I may, you know, start out playing the piano together, but in 10 years, you may be okay. And I still can't play because it's not our innateness or, or when a kid is pushed in a direction that's really not. But if you just, if you sit back and you listen to your innateness or, and, and really some of the Gallup tools help you identify these and then being intentional about developing them, which is, which is fantastic because, you know, the, the psychology behind it is I can manage my challenges better if I know, if I have the toolbox and the strengths to do that. So for example, I'm not ever going to be great at strategic planning. I'm aware of this. However, my ability to com communicate and offer a lot of questions through input can help that process along. Mm. So, um, you know, just like there's things that you can do to demonstrate confidence. It's the same kind of thing of there's, there's things that just work. So is it a, is it a, when your coaching approach, is it uh, for professionals? Is it uh -huh. life coaching? What, what platform is it? Or is it yes to all? Yes to all. Now I would not, you know, there are certain things, for example, you know, I am not an MD, right? And I am not a licensed practitioner. So, but you know, when you hear things, I say things like, you might want to you might want to investigate that or dive deeper or or perhaps get a nutritionist licensed neutral or speak with a licensed clinical social worker or professional counselor kind of thing so i understand where my scope ends but for a lot of this it is life it's career it's relational you know it's me as a a, a, a an adult female speaking to maybe another adult female about life experiences or we're in this together kind of thing so sure as long as as long as we know where to stop and where our scope is, um, which, you know, a, a, a good coach should know yeah. when they, when they're at the fringe of what they can do, then a lot of times people just want a sounding board and I want to help them walk through it on, you know, on their path. I can't tell them when to get off, get on the path or when it, when it ends from A to B, they might want to exit it, you know, <laughs> the second exit and they're good for now, you know, but they, I help them figure that out. I had a conversation in uh, during the onboarding process. This was probably four or five months ago with somebody and they go, I just really want somebody to tell me what I need to do. And I said, that's not how this works. I said, you already, most answers that you're going to mm -hmm. come to, you already know. It's just going to be, you're going to, I'm going to let you say it out loud. And then I'm going to, you're going to go, oh, that sounds stupid. Mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah, so don't do that one. <laughs> or you're going to go, right. that sounds brilliant. I'm going to go, yeah, then let's do that one. But, but it's funny. They said, I just want somebody to tell me the, tell me the right decision. And I'm like, mm -hmm. Well, heck, me too. Right. And, you know, but the thing is, is if somebody tells you to do it, um, there's this thing in us, you know, our conscious, our id, our ego mm -hmm. um, that that sits with us, you know, our soul, uh, the thing that is in our ear at night, if you will. And so you have to get to a place and, and a good coach helps you make sense of this in your ear, you mm -hmm. know. Or um, yeah, I, I, I have a you know certificate in nutritional psychology, which is basically what's going on in my brain. How do I feed my brain? You know, literally feed my brain with food, and then emotionally feed my brain. You know, my brain is tied to my body through a vagus nerve, and so this wonderful infrastructure in our head, this computer, if you will, can help us figure out a lot of things. But and sometimes we just need to have somebody say, you know, no, no, yes, yes, there you go. Do you have a do you have a morning routine or routines? Are you a routine person? I mean, is are you a habit driven driven person? You know, I, I one thing I want to always make sure is that my sleep is respected because I understand what happens when we go to sleep, and it takes about six hours for this GSL glymphatic cleaning process to get rid of the plaque in our brain, and if we don't, that it will turn to Alzheimer's. So I I always think that you you should have master your sleep, and you know, there's there's this rule of old thinking that said, you know, um, crazy people can't sleep kind of thing. But, you know, the, the new way is turn that around about a sleep disorder 
makes you kind of crazy kind of mm. thing because we must sleep or we like food we must do it and and we need time so um i i actually when i fall asleep seven hours later i wake up and i am just like this <laughs> I, I, do you, have you found you get up earlier now as you get because uh, as i've gotten a older, little bit I get up yeah yeah and i never really slept in late but and i don't need caffeine i'm just naturally this um so I, everything is decaf i know and I'm watching you. She's not touching her nose. She's telling the truth, that guy. I am. I am. I, I don't. I don't put caffeine in my body. Um, I just don't need it. And Because I have done that before, and I, I need to put myself in timeout. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I don't need caffeine. And I, and I listen to my body. So if it's 3 o'clock in the afternoon and my body is tired, um, fortunately in my career, I can usually go rest it, you know, kind of thing. And that's mm -hmm. nice. But... Um, you know, my routine, I like to, I'm a mover, I'm a doer, I'm a checklist achiever kind of thing. So I like to be busy. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I will put trash TV on and be useless. Are you, do you, so, binge you know, watch, what are you binge watching right now? Um, I'm actually watching Secession right now. Mm. It's really good. Um, it's, uh, I think it's on, I think it's on Hulu. Um, but I, you know, I like all of, I've done most of the ones that have been on Hulu and so forth uh, and yeah. some HBO. What about you? What do you like I'm to watch? I'm the Peaky Blinders, The Last Kingdom. Right. Uh, I love Yellowstone. I'm a, I okay. love Yellowstone. I'm a blacklist. I, the, my, one of my yeah. favorite shows and I'm very conservative. I'm well, I'm not very conservative. I am conservative. So I'm definitely on the right side of the, of, of the line. But one of my favorite shows ever that I got frustrated they took off of Netflix is West Wing. And mm, love I, I've watched West Wing all the way through probably seven times. Wow. wow. West, the acting is so good in that show. Yes. And, you know, a lot of them are. Yeah. And, um, have you ever heard of a show called Sense8? S-E-N-S-E -E and the number eight? Oh. And it was more expensive to produce than Game of Thrones per episode. Is it a Game of Thrones like? Is it? No, it it's, it has to do with your senses and a relationship between people. So any show that has high relationship things, like a million little things, um, uh, trash TV, like you know, Sister Wives or Married at First Sight, uh, Guilty. But I, I again, it's anything having to do with people relationships. I'm like, huh, hmm, huh, really, kind of thing. Have, do you have Netflix? Mm -hmm. Okay, there's oh, a yeah. there's a documentary on there called The Movies That Made Us. Okay. And it's, it takes all of the great movies, the 70s, 80s, and 90s that are we just mm -hmm. these iconic movies, and it right. goes into how each of it's fan it's fascinating. Oh. Okay, okay. I'll definitely check that out. How these movies got made, you're like, what? Yeah. No way. Well, um, even the one that just came out, the um the Desi and Lucy one, you know, Lucille Ball. I haven't seen it's it. not what you uh, it's actually it's out i was watching it today and it's actually not like you would think you know uh, it's how the ricardos how they operated in the industry you know kind of thing wow. uh, the back part of like the i love lucy show if you will see yeah. that's the kind of stuff i get fascinated by um i'm gonna play i'm gonna ask you some fun questions we're gonna wrap it up but i want to make sure that we that people know where to find your books and okay. if they want to find out more about your speaking and coaching, how do they get in touch with you on these on those matters, ma'am? All right. So the books, you can just Google my name, Donna Van Atten or Dr. Donna Van Atten. You can Google body language. The books are available on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and uh, according to Simon and Schuster, 36,000 distribution sites globally. Wow. That's awesome. <laughs> I know. I know. So when I like speak in Europe and stuff, it's kind of funny to see Amazon UK or Amazon Spain. Yeah. yeah. And have it come up and so forth. So you can find it there. My website is bodylanguagedoctor with a dr.com. Uh, my phone number is 42. 3-314-4141, the, the number I've had for almost 30 years. Wow. Was, I guess when cell phones came out and you could pick your phone number, I, I kept that one. So easy to find that way. But even just do a Google search and I pop up pretty easy. You know, yeah. there's I have several Google pages automatically. And, um, um, you know, so there's some podcasts, there's some speaking engagements. Um, I would love to speak at some or talk about speaking at someone's conference retreat. Um, I, like I said, I do travel and, uh, and, um, you know, that I did a nice, lovely retreat in uh, Tennessee recently. At a, at, they rented a retreat place and it was for their whole executive team. I was in California 
Um, so, you know, 2020, like for a lot of people, well, for me, was a huge year. It was the 20th anniversary of 9-11, basically. And I was speaking and, you know, was, I was scheduled to speak at a, the Oklahoma bombing site. And, you know, like many people, you know, our, our worlds went upside down. And it's nice to see, I think, 22, 2022 is going to be a real uptake. Which I'm so. pretty excited about. Yeah. Before I ask you these fun questions, because I like to end with fun questions, I want to make a suggestion to folks. Two suggestions. One, I think your books will make a great gift for somebody graduating. If there's hey, somebody, because oh, we got the graduating sis, uh, season coming up. Yeah. I mean, shameless plug. There you go. I mean, I'm serious. If you've got somebody getting ready to go into the real world, I think it's a good idea to give them that. And if you've got somebody going into politics, get them one about politics. Tell them not to oh, go yeah. into politics. That's what I would tell them. So. Oh. And that was a popular book, you know, for for the election. So the content of it is relevant every time an election comes around. You know, it wasn't it wasn't one of me. I, that I promise you, Clint, there was no burning desire. I want to I want to write a book on like politics. But the um, the to become a savvy viewer and savvy voter is worth checking it out. Well, here's what I liked about about this. We had this conversation when that book was just about to come out, and. If you are listening to this, you people out there in the whatever world, you. In, if you think, yes, I'll, I really watch the body language of those other people and they're terrible. Let me tell you, once you start watching politicians, you know that they all play the same games. They all have the same screw ups. They all it's, right. it's not one side versus the other. But I will say uh, with the characters, I think that we got the last two elections, three elections, and I don't think mm -hmm. it's going to change. I think we're going to keep getting characters that are kind of different than what we've traditionally seen. I think that book sure. is really relevant because now some of the norms aren't norms anymore. Correct. Correct. That the the rules for the platform or the playground have changed. Yeah. Correct. We are yeah. we like to be quickly entertained. Uh, we are quick to change, you know, uh, as far as you know, click, 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 swipe, swipe, swipe. You know, we and so it requires a um, certain type of political marketing to capture our attention and and that's sad um you know yeah. but people aren't going to sit and read a lot that we're very visual and so we like what we see or we don't i just did a, a podcast an episode about it's called politics by meme um because mm, now we're yeah. all it's you know I, i'll get donna i'll trap her with this well orchestrated meme and i'm like right hey, every problem can be boiled down to a t-shirt um Right, exactly. And I will say, I'm going to give you a quick plug because some of the things that you post are just spot on, hilarious, and um, very truthful and presented in a way of like, hmm, nicely put. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, I appreciate that very much. My last suggestion was for you is I think at some point in time over the next few years, unless you've already done it and I haven't found it, you should start doing your own consistent podcast. Oh yeah! Why don't you help me out with that? That we'll have that. We'll take that one offline. Okay. How's that? I, oh, I you well, know, I've yeah. done. I'm fortunate. I've done several podcasts, and um, I know there's a platform, you know, with other people, um, but my own. I just, um, well, you never can tell what 2022 might bring, right? Right. It's a great lead generator for you too, if you ever want to go down that road. Hey, let well, me thanks. ask you. Some, can we ask some fun questions? Here Let's do it. And I've asked you this probably, but it's been two years. Um. Pancakes or waffles? You can only have one for the rest of your life. Waffles. Good answer. That's You're right so far, 100%. Okay, that's because the little butter can sit in each pocket. Yeah, we've talked. Yeah, I think. Have I already asked right. you any questions? Have I asked you? Okay. No. French fry, well, then me and you are dead on. French fries, onion rings, or tater tots? You can only pick one. Oh, tater tots. You're, you're passing in class. Uh, you could only go on vacation one place from this point forward, mountains or beach? Beach. Yeah, see, that's I, I'm I burn too easy. All right, here's the Christmas questions. There's nothing worse than taking a pale Irish dude, July, <laughs> 100 degrees, rubbing paste on him, and then stick him in his sand and salt. Right, exactly. And say, hey, have a great. <laughs> okay. Well, my coloring is pretty fair. That's what they make umbrellas for, or the mountains. That's why they make the mountains. And that's right. That's right. <laughs> um, is Die Hard a Christmas movie, ma'am? Oh, yeah. I heard that whole thing about that. I'm going to have to say maybe, yeah, but not like an elf kind of thing or a, you know, Chevy Chase. That's it. Okay. The next question is, do you have a favorite Christmas movie? If you could only watch one in Christmas season, oh. what would it be? I, I really enjoy the National Lampoon ones. Yes, absolutely. Do you have a favorite Christmas song? 
Oh, the one they they ripped off of Instagram when I was singing to it in the car. That I really like the the Mariah Carey one. The all I want for Christmas. It's cheesy and all that, but it's it's dun 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 dun. dun, dun. Yeah, it going. has a good beat, and you can dance to it. <laughs> well, I feel like I'm on, like in the, like I'm getting the uh, the DJ's reversion. It's got a good beat. It's got to dance to it. That's right. That's all right. right. Last question for the Christmas: Is there a Christmas gift that you remember getting as a kid, or as a teenager, or as an adult that you go? that Christmas gift, and it may not be a big one, but you remember? Oh, sure. I mean, as a kid, you know, I loved Barbie. <laughs> and so, you know, that Barbie three-story house with that string elevator, Oh, you know, yeah. and then you had the Darby, the Barbie pool that you could actually put water, yeah. and it was the kind of the dough boy above ground, of course. The whole Barbie setup always rocked for me, from dune buggy to, but that, that Barbie, you know, three-story house, that thing was pretty awesome. Yeah, the two, I actually asked this today and I didn't mention it, but the two that, because this is, I love this kind of these memories this time of year, the Evil Knievel motorcycle that I would rev yes, up. Yes, of course, you revved up, yep. Mm -hmm. And then the Bionic Man, Steve Austin, where you could look through his eye though, and it had yep, the, yep. and so. Absolutely. You yeah. look in the back of his head, that's right, yep. and it went right through like a little telescope. <laughs> Here's the good thing about this, and we're wrapping it up. This is it. This is the last thing. This time of year, as I get older, it's easy to kind of go, well, I don't have my kids around as much. But there are millions of young kids that this mm -hmm. weekend are going to make those kind of memories. And that makes me happy. Oh, that's great. And you know what? I, I feel the same way because now my kids, like my kids are older than your kids and so forth. But So it does take on a different meaning. But one of the things I've really liked about getting older is I find little people really hilarious. Now their parents don't, and I didn't when I was at that, pay, but I find them absolutely entertaining in the sense of how they eat the candy. My thought is you're going to lose the teeth anyway. Um, you know, to let them run and jump and play and fall down, you have them so padded. But I've noticed that a lot of those parents don't share the same humor. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. That I do. <laughs> well, we grew up. We grew up in the back of pickup trucks and no right. seat belts. And my dad smoked in the car with the windows up. Oh yeah, my sister was born, and I'm like, oh yeah. And you, of course, don't even think about coming home early. And there's no GPS tracker on you. There were lights on the street that said it's dark, gotta go. Yep. And there's right. pay, there's these things called payphones, kids. It was fun times. We grew up in it good was. times, Dad All right, we did, we did. And thank God there were no cameras to uh to record any of it. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't do anything that was... Me you know, neither, me, me neither. neither. Dr. Donna Van Atten, as always, it is a lot of fun catching up with you. I love what you do, and I hope people go buy your books. And if you need a coach or you're needing a speaker, then I hope they reach out to you as well. Thank you so much. I hope so too. Thanks, Clint. Yeah. Pleasure. Happy holidays. Be safe out yeah. there, okay? Merry Christmas, everybody. Thank you. Bye, everybody.